There's a story about a preacher that once went to Italy. And there he saw the grave of a man that had died centuries before. But that man that had died, he knew had been an unbeliever. Completely against Christianity, but somewhat afraid of it also. And the individual that died, the, the unbelieving man, when he, when he died, he gave instructions ahead of time that a huge stone slab was to be put over his grave so that in the event there would be a resurrection, he didn't want to be raised. And he even put a message on the slab, carved, had it carved in the slab so people could come by and read it. And the message said, I do not want to be raised from the dead because I don't believe in it. Well, when they came to bury him and the hole was open, they were putting his body in there. Evidently, an acorn had fallen down into the hole. And eventually, it was filled up. And over time, the acorn grew and sprouted up and eventually went up through the ground and even split the slab and was a towering oak. And the minister there that day looked over at that tree and he had a thought. He said, if that acorn, which has the power of biological life in it, can split a slab of that magnitude, what can the acorn of God's resurrection power do in a person's life? See, in our text this morning, Jesus, or tonight rather, Jesus is returning to Jerusalem. Now, we know he's in the temple. If you'll read in Mark chapter 11 and on into 12, you recognize Jesus is coming back to Jerusalem and he goes to the temple. The reason he's headed that way is because he's been told Lazarus is sick. And not only sick, but he's nigh unto death. And so Jesus is working his way back to Bethany. And if you've ever wondered, because, you know, you've heard the song that Karen Peck sings. You know, he was four days late, but he was really on time. And, and, and even the, uh, Mary and Martha wondered why he hadn't got there in time. If you ever wonder what Jesus was doing during those days, this is it. And so he comes to Jerusalem and he heads to the temple. First thing he does when he gets there is he finds money changers, throws them out. Causes all kinds of stir. And then he, he takes time to share some parables with those that will listen to him. And then the scribes and the elders and all those, they're coming out. They're trying to trip him up. They're trying to trap him. They're trying to do all these things. They're, they're plotting how to kill him. And, and, and they, they're not successful. So then the Pharisees show up and they try the same thing. They're not successful either. Now it's the Sadducees' turn. And if you wonder who the Sadducees might be, we could describe them as being the strict fundamentalists of the day. And, and, and the Sadducees only adhered to the law of Moses. That was the first five books of the Old Testament. They denied the supernatural. We even read here they, they do not believe in the resurrection. They, they, they don't believe in life beyond the grave. And they come to Jesus with a ludicrous scenario, don't they? I mean, it's a woman that's outlived seven husbands and then finally she dies herself. And the question they pose to Jesus regards what they don't even believe. It regards the afterlife. And what their question was is that when they all rise, because they knew Jesus believed in the resurrection, he would prove it there shortly thereafter when he would finally get to Lazarus' grave. They ask him, whose wife is this woman gonna be? She had seven husbands while she was living down here. They all get raised from the dead together. They're all going to be in heaven. Who's she going to belong to? And as you might imagine, they didn't get the answer they were looking for because Jesus exposed their ignorance. But in this passage, though, that's the, that's the lead up to it. That's what we can see on the surface. But in this passage, what Jesus does do is he affirms many things that are very important for us as Christians to know. Now think about it for just a moment. Let me, let me, let me hone us in for just a second. If this story is true, we don't know that it is, we don't know that it isn't, it seems kind of ludicrous to me, but it could have very well been a real story. 
If it was, you find here's the story of a woman that for most of her adult life has been surrounded by death. Everything that she is counting on, everyone that she is holding to, every person that her future is linked to are all dying. Over and over again, she finds herself alone, she finds herself afraid, and she finds herself insecure. I wonder if anyone here tonight has ever found themselves in a place like this woman was continually finding herself in. Maybe you're here tonight with a marriage that's on life support. Maybe you're here tonight and your dreams have been dashed on the rocks of disappointment. Maybe the condition of your health is such that you've just about thrown, it, thrown in the towel. You've about given up. I want you to know something tonight. When we understand this passage, there is good news for all of us. Because see, the minute that you decide to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit comes into your life. And with the Holy Ghost, with the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost, comes the power of the resurrection. Now understand this. That is the same power that rolled the stone away when Jesus was raised from the dead. Now think of the things in your life that seem to be immovable slabs. Things like bitterness, insecurity, fear, self-doubt. All those things are slabs that are in our way that we see as immovable. But yet those things can be split and rolled away by the power of the resurrected Christ. The more you know Jesus, the more you grow in the power of resurrection. So if you find yourself tonight living among the dead, there's hope. Because when we examine this text tonight, we learn something. We learn how we can live when everything around us seems to be dying. So the question that I see in this text tonight, if I would title a message, is how can I live when everything is dying? How can I live when everything is dying. If I'm going to live when it seems like all is dying around me, then the first thing is I have to rely on the truth. I must rely on the truth. You know, I, I was sitting over there just a few moments ago and I was looking at some, some scriptures and, and, and I, came, I came across 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I don't have this wrote down. This is... This is, this is ad libbing as a go right here, all right? But in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse number 10 says this. Listen to this right here. Now, by the way, this is the chapter where Paul deals with tongues and speaking in tongues and all that. And I just want to hone in on this one verse for just a moment. Paul said, there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world and none of them is without signification." There's a lot of voices in this world. They all speak, and none of them are without trying to make a point or trying to be worthy to be listened to. None of them are without any significance. They all have a purpose. They all seem to be having a plan, all these things. And when I think about relying on the truth, I've got to ask myself the question, what voice am I listening to? Because there's a lot of voices speaking in this world. But the question is, what voice do I listen to? See, how do I live when everything around me seems to be dying? I can hear all these voices, these voices of doubt, these voices of fear, these voices of insecurity, these voices of all these other things, and I can say, oh, well, and, and they're all speaking to me, and they're all saying you, that, that, that everything is just dying. There's no hope. There's no direction in life. You're not going to make it through. How can you get by with it? All these things, and all these voices are coming at us, and I've got a choice. I can either listen to those voices, or I can finally tune those voices out and I can listen to the truth. The question is tonight, which voice will you listen to? 
because the devil is a liar. He is the liar and the father of all lies and he is gonna say all of your hope is gonna die, all of your dreams are gonna die, everything you're striving for is going to die. You cannot have a successful marriage. You cannot have children that are serving the Lord. You cannot be successful in your finances. You cannot have health. You cannot have a future. You cannot have peace. You cannot have joy. You can never succeed. He's gonna say all these things to you. You can buy into it if you want to but if you're going to live when it seems like all is dying you've got to rely on the truth you've got to rely on the truth the Bible said let God be true and every man a liar every other voice that speaks anything that opposes this word is a lie it's a lie to be rejected and listen, friends, if we're going to live when everything else around us is dying, we've got to rely on the truth. You say, preacher, where do I find truth? You remember that was Pilate's question, wasn't it? What is truth? Where do I find truth then, preacher? I mean, you're telling me to rely on truth and I'm hearing this voice and I'm hearing that voice and this is telling me this and my circumstances are telling me that and all these things and reality seems to be telling me all these things and what are you talking about, preacher? It looks like everything around me is dying and you're telling me that there's hope. You're telling me there's a future. Where are you getting that stuff from? I find that in the word of God. I find that in the book. <laughs> I find it in the book. Do you remember what I said when I led into this message? The more you know about Jesus, the more you come to know about resurrection power. Do you remember what Paul said in his epistle? He said, that I may know him. And one of the ways he wanted to so know Jesus was through the power of his resurrection. Can I ask you something? Do you know Jesus through the power of his resurrection? Because see, it's his power of his resurrection that takes dead bones in a valley and he speaks to them and the bones arise. It's his power that takes dead marriages and makes them alive again. It's his power that takes dead hopes and brings them to life again. It's his power that takes dead dreams and brings them to fruition. It is his power that takes dead ventures and makes success out of them. It is his power that takes a sinner that has fallen and raises them to new life. And it is his power that takes a child of God that has stumbled and raises him up again and puts him on the right path. It's the power of the resurrected Christ. The question is, what voice will you listen to? What voice will you listen to tonight? Because see, if you are going to live when everything else is dying, you gotta rely on the truth. And the truth is found in the word of God. The Bible said Jesus answered unto them in verse number 24, and he said, do you not err therefore because you know not the scriptures? So many folks err tonight because they don't know the word of God. They don't know the word of God. John Phillips said that ignorance of the word of God is at the bottom of all unbelief. I've ministered to folks and I, I, you've heard me and I've said this before many times in this church and I kid around when I say this but I'm saying it in all seriousness this time. I've ministered to folks that I will tell them the word of God and I'll say this is the path. This is what God says. This is the direction to go based on your circumstance and based on the situation and, and, and it's, like I'm, it's like I'm herding goats. Because they say, I understand that, but preacher. I know the Bible says that, but preacher. I, 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 I get where you're coming from, but preacher. And if they, they butt everything, which is what a goat does, doesn't it? Just butts everything. And I think, man alive, it's a bunch of goats. You know, it's not but it's yes. <laughs> it's yes. <laughs> but you don't understand, preacher. Don't need to. I know one that does. 
but you've never been in my situation, preacher. I may not have, but I know one that has. And by the way, he wrote it. (laughs) It's his book. It's his truth. He knew you was gonna be there before he ever created this world, and he ordained there'd be a book. He knew your marriage would suffer, but he wrote a book. He knew your reputation would suffer, but he wrote a book. He knew your health would go dead, but he wrote a book. He knew your finances might go down, but he wrote a book. He knew your faith would be weak, but he wrote a book. (laughs) He wrote a book. And so many Christians that know the word, listen, oh, I got to be careful because I'll make somebody mad when I say this. Please don't let me make you mad when I say this, all right? Please don't let me make you mad because I am not trying to be offensive when I say this. But we have so many Christians that know so many words of so many songs but don't know this book. They can sing them in church day in and day out. Don't even have to even tell them to pick the hymn book up. When the, when the praise group gets up, the church knows every word right along with them. Ask them to quote a scripture that deals with the situation they're in and they're absolutely dumbfounded because they never thought it important enough to learn the book. You've got to rely on the truth. And the truth is found in God's word. Ravi Zacharias said, Jesus Christ did not come to make bad people good, but to make dead people alive. That's the power of resurrection. God didn't ask you to turn over a new leaf. God told you to die. For the wages of sin is death. Die out to it. Die out to sin. Die out to unbelief. Die out to the circumstances. Die out to your helplessness. Die out to your feebleness. Die out to your hopelessness. Die out to all of it because then he can raise you up in the power of his life. Die out to it. But I don't know the answer, preacher. That's exactly why you gotta die out to it. I don't know what to do. Good. It's exactly where he wants you. What do I do? Where do I go? How do I proceed? May I just encourage you to start out by getting in the book. (laughs) Just get in the book. Start right there. When you're worried, open the book. When you're scared, open the book. When you just got into a fight with your husband, open the book. When you just fell into sin and you hope nobody knows about it, but you know you messed up, get in the book. Get in the book because that's where the truth is at. That's where you find the truth. Rely on the truth they aired because they did not know the word of God. But they erred also because they did not know the works of God. Because he said, you not only don't know the scriptures, but you don't know the power of God either. They not only didn't know his word, they didn't know his works. Because when you don't believe in resurrection... You don't believe anything can be raised up. When you don't believe in resurrection, when the marriage dies, it's dead. When you don't believe in resurrection, when the doctor pronounces it, that must be the end. When you don't believe in resurrection, then when the bankruptcy hits, I guess that's all there is. (laughs) When you don't believe in resurrection and your dreams have died, then I guess that's just it. (laughs) See, when you don't believe in resurrection, and so many Christians today tell me they believe in resurrection, but then something dies, and I'll say, listen, tap into Jesus. Oh, no, preacher, there's just no hope. (laughs) There's just no hope. Well, preacher, I tried. (laughs) I tried. 
I sat down and I tried and I, I talked with them and I tried to work it out and oh, I just couldn't do it, preacher. I just, and it just died. I'm sorry, I, I was just nothing else I could do. That was the whole problem. You tried and you didn't let him. This is revival. Revival digs deep. Revival gets down to the roots. Revival reveals the problems and provides the solutions. See, they know the power of God. This is the same Jesus in this temple that had already raised up Jairus' daughter from the dead. This is the same Jesus that had already went to Nain and as they were carrying a young man out in a coffin, he touches the coffin and he rises from the dead. That had already happened, but yet these nitwits said there's no resurrection. And just shortly after this will happen, he'll head out to Bethany and he'll look over at Lazarus' sisters and say, where'd you lay him? Where'd you lay him? And they'll take him to a tomb and he'll say, Brother Brad, he'll say, roll that stone away. And they'll say, oh, no, wait, whoa, hey, hey, wait a minute now. Why, well, Lord, he's been in there four days already. <laughs> he's decomposing in there. It's a mess. In, let, don't open that up. <laughs> and he would simply cry out, Lazarus, come forth. And a dead man would rise. And he would go on to say, even before he'd done that, he would say, I am the resurrection and the life. Look at that. Even Siri's amen in the night. I've never had artificial intelligence come to church. <laughs> Maybe I have. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but he would say just a few verses earlier before he would ever raise up Lazarus from the dead, he would tell those sisters, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And then he would look at them and he'd say, Believest thou this? There's a lot of voices that's going to speak to you in this life. The question is, which one will you listen to? I choose to rely on the truth tonight. For ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. The truth is found in the Word of God. The truth is found in the works of God. How do I live when everything around me is dying? I not only rely on the truth, but I rejoice in the truth. Truth is good. Amen. Truth is good. Some folks don't like the truth, don't want the truth, but truth is good. Truth is good. What's the truth then, preacher? The truth is that God makes all things new. Yeah, Isn't that what he said? That's in this book, by the way. Yeah. He said, behold, I make all things new. Does that include you? Are you part of all things? Are your dreams part of all things? Are your hopes part of all things? Are your desires part of all things? Is your, is your marriage part of all things? Is health and finances a part of all things? What's part of all things? I dare say all things are, don't you? Yeah. And he said, behold, I make all things new. And so we not only rely on the truth, but we rejoice in the truth because God is in the business of making all things new because verse number 25, there was no question as far as Jesus was concerned because he said, for when they shall rise from the dead. He didn't say if they shall rise from the dead, but he said it's only a matter of time till they arise from the dead. Oh, but you say, Pastor, it's hopeless for me. I say, why don't you listen to the truth for a while? Because it's only only a matter of time before Jesus shows up. It's only a matter of time before God does a work. It's only a matter of time before the stone is rolled away and out comes something you never thought you'd see. It's only a matter of time. And I don't know about you tonight, but I rejoice in that. I rejoice in that tonight. 
Because, see, he resurrects. He resurrects. Not only does he resurrect, and I could go on to the valley of dry bones. I could do all these things. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, for this corruption must put on incorruption. If that's going to be the case, then this thing's got to die, get buried, and something else has got to come up. <laughs> for this corruption must. There is no question in the mind of Jesus. This will be resurrected. Not only does he resurrect, he restores. It'd be one thing if you died and he brought you back to life and he just put you in a desert. But he restores. He restores. See, even the prophet even talked about God's restoration power because he even records in the book of Joel, I will restore to you the years the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. See, all those things that have eaten away at your life, all those years you've spent in sin, all those times you made the mistakes, all those things that you wasted in life, and the worms ate them, and the caterpillars, got them, all these things just eating away at you and God says when I resurrect you I'll restore that that Satan has robbed you of <laughs> are you going to listen to the truth tonight are you going to listen to the truth see he resurrects he restores and then he renames I praise God Brad I'm not what I used to be brother because, see, there was old Abraham, and Abraham, God changed his name. He started out as Abram, and he became Abraham, father of many nations. Then there was Jacob, Jacob the old deceiver, Jacob the old trickster, Jacob that was always trying to look after himself and turn something his way, and who knew somebody else so he could get ahead? All of a sudden, he became Israel. He would be a prince. And then there was Simon, old Simon. God said, even though he would deny that he knew Jesus, God said that one day he'd be a rock. <laughs> what mistakes have you made? What mistakes have you made that the devil said you can't ever come back from? What mistakes have you made that all of a sudden that voice, all them voices are coming at you and they're saying, yeah, you're worthless. <laughs> yeah, you're useless. You'll never be what you once were. You're just going to have to just live with being Simon because that old rock thing, that's not going to happen. <laughs> you know. And God says, listen, listen, I will resurrect. I will restore and I'll rename you <laughs> because see, praise God, when I go down, I come back up as somebody else <laughs> and I glorify his prayer. You know, when we get to heaven, we'll have a new name. <laughs> that's what the Bible says. Amen. We get to heaven, we'll have a new name because it's all been made new. It's all we mean to. What do you do? What do you do when everything around you is dying? Your hopes are dying. Your dreams are dying. Your faith is dying. Your zeal is dying. All these things are dying. It seems like no matter which way you turn or what you do, you try. Do you think that woman that had the issue of blood for 12 years thought that? She thought she was dying? And, and no doubt her hope was dying and ebbing right out of her. Her, her. her dreams are dying. Because the Bible said she had tried physician after physician after physician. She spent everything that she had and she didn't get a bit better, but rather she got worse. Amen. Do you think she thought she was living amongst the dying? She was the dying, but she heard a man named Jesus was coming. Listen, friends, somebody told her the truth. Jesus is on his way. And you know what? She had a choice. She could have said, well, he's no, he can't help. I've tried physicians and none of them worked. There ain't no point in trying no more. And she could have just said, I'm just gonna hang out here, live out what time I got left, do the best I can and let be what will be. But you know what she did? She listened to the truth. He was on his way and she said, I've got to be there. Yeah. Listen, what do you do? 
What do you do to live when everything is dying? You rely on the truth. You rejoice in the truth. The truth is God makes all things new. And the truth is that God will meet all of your needs. Can I just give you this one right here? In verse 25, I want you to look at this just a second. Jesus said, For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. Now, I just want to clarify that when we die or our loved ones die, God doesn't get another angel in heaven. All right? You see a lot of people post that stuff on social media. Well, my loved one died and they got another, God took another angel. Friend, your loved one did not become an angel. All right? Listen to me. Don't, don't get mad at me and I'll tell you this. There is no evidence, none, Zero, not one verse of scripture in this entire book that gives any type of inference whatsoever that anybody that dies becomes angels in heaven. None. Zero. What the Bible tells us is we become better than the angels. Why settle for less? <laughs> Why settle for less? See, because the Bible said Jesus was made a little lower than the angels for the purpose of suffering in his life and all things. But when he did that, the Bible said that God raised him up and gave him a name that was above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow, every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. His name would be above all the other names and David said, I will be satisfied when I raise in your likeness. I'm not looking to go to heaven and be like an angel. I'm looking at going to heaven and being like a savior. Praise his name. I won't be the savior, but I know that I will be like him for I shall see him as he is. And that's truth I can rejoice in. That's truth I can rejoice in. Now, let's get back to that text a second. Took a sidetrack. Right. You know what this means? God not only makes all things new, but God meets all your needs. Why is there no marrying and giving in marriage in heaven? Why? Why? She had one husband, he died. She gets another husband, he dies, gets another husband. She needs a husband, don't she? When she gets to heaven, she doesn't need a husband. <laughs> Remember, he said you'll be like the angels. Angels don't marry in heaven, do they? God's not up there. Jesus standing there with a little podium in front of him and two angels come before him and he says, I now pronounce you angel and angel. <laughs> you know, he's not doing that, okay? In heaven, the angels don't need husbands. They don't need wives because all of their needs are met. When we get to heaven, we'll be married to him, praise God. Amen. We no longer need husbands and things. Now, I know we'll be known as we're known. I know we'll know who our wife was down here. We'll know who our husband is down there. We'll know who our children were down there. We'll know all those things. But we don't need that kind of relationship anymore because we have one that completely satisfies and meets every need we'll ever have throughout all eternity. And that's truth we can rejoice in. Now, you say, what does that mean to me, preacher? If he will meet all of your needs there, he'll meet all your needs here. What do you need today? Do you need a touch from God? He can meet that need. Do you need a restart in your marriage? He can meet that need. Do you need a fresh hope tonight? He can meet that need. Do you, would you like to have a financial turnaround? I'm not going to tell you that he's going to pay your mortgage tomorrow. He's going to give you a Cadillac or a Lexus tomorrow. I'm not telling you any of those things. But if you need a financial restart, I believe God has the power to do that. What do you need tonight? Do you need joy because you've been living in, in depression for so long? Do, do, you, do you need hope because you've been living in despair for so long? What, do you need freedom because you've been living in addiction for so long? Can I tell you something tonight? God can do that. He can do that. We rely on the truth. 
we rejoice in the truth and then we rest in the truth. A lot of folks, they hear the truth but they don't rest in it. There's still a mess. God says rest in the truth. What's the truth, preacher? What do you mean rest in the truth? Let me show you this just a second. I'm done, all right? Verses 26 and 27. This is one of those I, I really don't have, Brother Richard. I really don't have two more points after this one, brother. This is it. This is the last one, all right? <laughs> he says, As touching the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. He said, There, there you err. Listen, I rest in the truth. Now, notice this. He said, touching the dead there. And he said, remember in the book of Moses, remember the Sadducees, they only would rely on the books of Moses. And Jesus says, well, didn't you read in there? That when Moses came to that bush, remember that bush I'm talking about, don't you? That was the bush that wasn't consumed. That was the bush that Moses came to when he was 80 years old and God said, get your shoes off, you stand on holy ground. It was that bush. And he said, don't you remember God telling you in that scripture, how he said, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. What I notice about I am is that that's present tense. And it's not just present tense once, but it's present tense continual. Just as I am the God of Abraham today, I am the God of Abraham tomorrow. I am the God of Abraham six months from now. I am the God of Abraham 5,000 years from now. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. And the funny thing was is when God said that, Jacob had been dead for 200 years. Isaac had been dead for 225 years. And Abraham had been dead for 330 years. They had been dead for centuries, but God said, I am their God. Not I was while they were living, but I am right now. Why? Because the truth is, they are still alive. <laughs> You think this thing you're going through is going to kill you and that's why you can't find any rest. You think this is the end of me. You think I can't get through this. You think I am doomed from this point on and God says you believe the lie and you can't find rest because even if you die, you're still alive because I'm not the God of the dead. I am the God of the living. And if God be for you, who can be against you? The devil says, this is going to kill you. And you say, listen, devil, you're a liar because I serve a God that's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And if he's the God of the living and he's my God, that means I'm never going to die. I like this. I hope it's sunk into you. I'm afraid it hadn't, but I hope it has. Because so many folks today, this is the end. It's the end of my marriage. It's over. And God says, wait a minute. I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living. It's the end of my family. And God says, I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living. This is the end of my hope. This is the end of my freedom. This is the end of my future. This is the end of all things. It's, it's done. I'm, I'm done for. I'm, I, I'm just, it's over. And God says, I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living. <laughs> What's dying in your life right now? What's dying in your life right now? Is it your hope? Is it your dreams? Is it your future? Is it your marriage? Is it your ministry? Is it your home? Your family? Your finances? What's, what's dying in your life right now? 
through the Word of God, you can learn how to live when everything else around you seems to be dying. You can learn how to live when everything around you seems to be dying. All you got to do is rest in the truth. Rest in the truth. And the way you rest in the truth is because you're relying on truth. And you rejoice in the truth. I go back to this verse. And Brother Richard, this really is it, brother. I'm just going to go back to the verse that I read to start with that I ad-libbed in this thing. The Bible says, the Bible says, there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world and none of them is without signification. There's a lot of voices talking to you tonight. But can I just remind you of what Jesus said about his sheep? He said, my sheep hear my voice and another they'll not follow. Whose voice have you been following? Whose voice have you been following? You may be here tonight and you're ready to throw up, throw in the towel. You're ready to just give up. I, 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 it's never going to get any better. It's just doomed to failure. It's going to kill me. It's hopeless. Whatever the case might be. I've come here to tell you tonight, there's good news. You have a Savior on the throne tonight. And all power and all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. And he said, if you believe in me, you shall never die because I am not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living.